guys, and welcome to episode one of the Unarmed Podcast. You know, I think a lot of who you are today and where you are today is reflected from your past. It is reflected from how you were raised, uh, where you grew up, who you grew up around, um, and, and the people that inspired you and motivated you and impacted your life along the way. That, that, that really has something to say about who you are right now. Um, so for this first episode, I didn't really want to give you a full extreme timeline of my past leading up to my accident. I kind of wanted to pinpoint the people that meant to m- the most to me, the people that impacted me the most, um, the lessons that really stuck with me, and the specific moments in my life that were really turning points for me and and that go to show the type of person that I am. So I wanted to start off with some impactful people that have really made a difference in my life and in the way that I view things and in the way that I think. Uh, We're gonna start with none other than my mother. Uh, My mother, Mary Lou Cantu, she is a very, very strong individual. And every time someone asks me in an interview, you know, where do you get your strength from? Where does this attitude come from? She is the first person that I bring up because my mother is such a strong individual. And if you ask anybody who personally knows her, they will tell you the same thing. This woman suffers from migraine headaches, like the debilitating migraine headaches and she will find a way to still get up and to still get things done and that showed when I was younger I saw that when I was younger I saw her push through the pain to get shit done I saw that that stuck with me that still sticks with me because she's still the same way if she comes to Florida and she visits and, and you know, we ask her to, to help babysit my son walk in. You know, she'll be having a migraine headache and I'm like, mom, go lay down. And she's like, no, 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 no. Like, it's okay, I got it, I'm fine. Um, and she's just a strong woman. She was always the leader of the pack in our families. That's not to downplay my father's role in the family, but she was the leader of the pack when it came to my family. My family consisted of myself, my sister Jennifer, my father Raul, and then my mom Mary Lou. Uh, But she was the leader of our pack. She was the lioness. She got things done. She was the decision maker and she was the one that just made everything happen for us. Um, And she also at the same time has a heart of gold. This woman always put everyone before herself. Um, you know, and I, I saw that there were times, you know, my money, my money, I'm sorry, my family wasn't, uh, very wealthy. We didn't have a lot of money, but we always found a way to make it. We always found a way to get food on the table. We found a way, uh, to get my sister and I school clothes for the new school year, school supplies, whatever it is that we, that we needed at the time. Um, and I, I remember one day that my mother made us dinner and I ate my plate and I was still hungry, but there wasn't that much food left and my mom hadn't eaten yet. My mom always did this. She served my sister, me, and my dad, and she would not eat until she knew we were full. And if there was any food left over, then she would eat. She still liked that to this day. I'm like, mom, eat. She's like, no, 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 you eat first, I'll eat next. Uh, you got to love her for that. And, and these things that you think that kids don't pay attention to these little minute details, but we do. We do pay attention. We very much know what's going on in this, in this big old world that you think that we don't understand anything, but we do. And things like that stick with us. They play a, a very big role in the way that we grow up and the way that we view the world. We see the world through our parents' eyes. We do, we really, really do. My father, on the the other hand, he was more of my coach. He was more of my mentor in life, my educator, my teacher. Um, my, My parents played very, very different roles in my life. My mother, like I said, was the leader of the pack and that is how I saw her. She was the queen and the king 
in my family. Uh, and my dad was my mentor. He was my coach. He was the one with the brains. My father is the one who got me into softball. He introduced me to sports and it was the best thing that he could have ever done for me. Um, he put me in softball at a very young age. At, at that time, I think it's called T-ball when you go in at such a young age. And he put me in something, whether he knew this or not, he set me up for success in the future by putting me into these sports. Luckily, I was a kid that very much enjoyed these sports. It stuck with me as I went on through high school. Um, I had a, a deep, deep love for this. My dad was a baseball player when he was in high school. So softball was just something that, you know, he, he hoped and he wished that I would love just as much as he loved baseball. And I did. I had a very, very strong love for it. My sister, on the other hand, was very heavily into volleyball. I gave volleyball a shot. <clears throat> it just wasn't really my thing. But softball, on the other hand, man, that was my fucking sport. That was my love. That was my heart. That was my passion. Um, my sister, my sister is older. My sister is technically considered my half sister. Uh, we do have different fathers, but I don't. I don't say none of this half sister shit. It's just for technicalities. She is my whole sister. She is my blood. She is me. We are one. Um, my sister was someone that I always looked up to because she was the older sibling. And you always look up to the older sibling. You look at what they do, you learn from them. And even if you think we're not learning from you as younger siblings, we are. Um, I watched her play volleyball and it was because of her that I wanted to play volleyball. It was because of her that I would look at my parents' faces as we were sitting in the bleachers and we would watch her play volleyball and they were so proud of her. So proud that, that she was making these plays and making points and I, I thought, I want that. I want my parents to be proud of me, which I'm sure they were very much proud of me, but I, I wanted that. What they were, what I was seeing in their eyes, I wanted to see that in their eyes for me. Um, so my sister is someone that I looked up to. She's someone that I learned from because a lot of what she went through in life came very far after for me, but I kind of learned through what she went through and, and things that she did in her life. I learned a lot from her. Um, and, and so she's a great person. I, I, I wish my sister and I were closer. You know, I, I see sisters that are so tight and so close, but unfortunately that's just not the relationship I have with my sister. Um, I love her to death, but we're just not the ones that text every day or phone call every day, or I have to tell, she's the first person I have to tell what happened. It, we're just not like that. And that's okay. You know, that's how some siblings are. Uh, we still got mad love for each other, but we're just not as tight knit as I always hoped and wish we could be. And my mother kind of tells me the same thing too. You know, I always wished you and Jennifer were very tight with each other, but that's just not the case. Um, so that's my sister. That's my immediate family. That's my mother. That's my father. That's my sister. Um, my Theos and my Theas had a big role in, in my life as well. Um, we as a family and as Hispanics were very family oriented. It's a very tight knit family. Uh, we always had family gatherings. We always got together as a big group for Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, birthdays, weddings. You know, it was always a big group of us. Um, and, and, and that family uh, integration in my life was very important for me. It was, it's still very important for me. It, it played a role in the way that I want to raise my son and the way that I want my family to be. Um, you know, it, having family around is, is a big deal and having so much family around that are continually encouraging you and uplifting you and are there for you and helping you, that takes a big toll on how you grow up and how you're led into your life when you become independent. So my family is, is a big part of me. They're still a big part of me. Unfortunately, um, I live in Florida now and they are still in uh, South Texas, um, but they still mean a lot to me to this day. So next, I wanted to kind of go into the things that were game changers in my life and that were very impactful for me and, and the people that were within these moments that I'm about to talk about. 
um, and how they treated me and how they, they just, they're a big part of me to this day. We're going to take it back to sports, um, specifically softball. We're going to talk a little bit about tennis. We're going to talk a little bit about a group uh, that I was in in high school called Estudiantina, but softball is going to be our main focal point here um, and because it, it, it holds the most importance in my life. Um, in high school, you know, I, in middle school, I didn't play sports. I'm not sure why. I mean, they didn't offer softball in middle school. I think middle school is where I tried volleyball and it just wasn't for me. Uh, but high school is where I really got heavily involved in sports again because that's just the type of person I was. Um, I was I was an athletic person. I, I had good grades. I didn't have the best grades, but I had, you know, okay grades that, that got me to where I needed to be. But sports was my deal in high school. That was my go-to specifically softball because my father had instilled it in me at such a young age. Uh, so immediately, you know, I wanted to try out for softball as a freshman. Uh, my father, with the money that we scrummaged up, you know, he got me the best bat, the best glove, the best bag to hold all my equipment, uh, my shin guards, my cleats, my socks, everything that I would have needed to make me successful in softball. And he even, you know, besides that, that's not even, the equipment is not even the important part of playing a sport. It's the person putting on the equipment that is the most important, the most important part of the sport. Um, and he, he raised me well. He instilled patience in me. He instilled hard work in me that all that led me to, you know, want to be a good, good athlete for him. And so I went into softball. I will say that I was not the best player in softball. Um, I was very mediocre at best. Uh, I would love to sit here and say like, yeah, I was the number one softball player. And absolutely not. That's just not who I was. Um, so I went in, I tried out, and I made JV. Um, you know, I, I hoped I would have made varsity. I hoped in my heart that I was good enough to make varsity, but that just wasn't the case. Um, and I attended Ed Calchosa High School in Elsa, Texas. Uh, Ed Calchosa High School is known for sports. They are known to pump out some of the most incredible athletes that you will ever see in your life. We were known to have the best football team. We were known to have a good baseball team, a good basketball team, good volleyball team. We were known for sports. Not so much our grades, but our sports. Um, so that's what we were known for, you know? And so I went in there. I would have loved to have a varsity jersey on my freshman year in softball, but that just wasn't the case. And that was okay. You know, I did a lot of learning in JV. Um, I, I was very strict on myself and going to practice every single day, putting in the work that I needed to put in to be able to make myself a better athlete because you know, I just didn't have the natural talent that some of these girls had. Some of these girls were incredible. The arms, the speed, you know, the way that they're able to think of these plays on the spot when the ball comes to them, the power that they had behind the bat, it was incredible. And I wished I had that naturally, but that just wasn't the case. I had to work hard to be able to get to where they were. And even at that, by the end of my senior year, I, you know, I could say that I wasn't even half the athlete some of those girls were. But it was a different part of me that, that the importance comes from. And so with that, um, you know, I played JV softball. I was, I was playing frequently, you know, we won some games, we lost some games, we weren't the best team, but we did what we could, and I practiced day in and day out because one day I wanted to wear the varsity jersey. And then on top of that, I also tried tennis because a lot of my closest friends in high school were going to try out tennis, and I thought, why not? If my friends are going to do it, I, I want to be able to do it too. So I tried out tennis. And lo and behold, a sport that I never would have imagined in my life to have liked or been intrigued by, I just joined it because my friends were joining it. I was naturally fucking good at tennis. It, it was so weird. And now I'm not gonna sit here and say that like, I walked into that court and I was hitting these balls left and right. No, that wasn't the case. What had happened was, I went onto that court and the coach was showing us, 
you know, how, how to do a backhand, how to hit a ball and all this other stuff, how to do a slice. And um, as I was going through the moon, I was learning, you know, one day I was doing backhands, you know, we would get in a line one by one, do a backhand next, do a backhand next. And the coach saw something in the way that I would swing my racket. He saw something in the way that I pivot or in the way that I move. And he was like, hey, like, you got it. Like, I really think you've got it. And in my freshman year, I was playing in varsity competitions. And that felt awesome for me. I love that for myself. I was like, hell fucking yes. Like, I'm a freshman and I'm playing varsity. That was so cool to me. But while I was playing tennis or practicing at tennis, what do you think is in the back of my mind? It's softball. It's softball that I would have rather been playing. It's softball that I wish I had the natural talent for, not tennis. And although I liked it, I never loved it. And there came a point in high school where my tennis coach came up to me and he's like, listen, you've got what it takes, but you need to completely focus and give me your 100% and you're not giving me your 100% because you are still half in softball. I need you here 100% so that we can do great things. And, you know, I had to tell him flat out that no, no, this is not where my heart is. I do like tennis, but this is not where my heart is. My heart is in softball. And even though I'm not the best fucking player in softball, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make myself the greatest fucking player in softball that I need to be. And that was that. He was pretty pissed at me. He ignored me for a while. The only reason he talked to me was because I took his speech class and he had to talk to me. Um, And he got over it eventually. But, you know, that was that. I I left tennis because my heart was not in that sport. And why do something if your heart is not there? If you're doing it because you're naturally good at it, but you don't really love it, why are you doing it? Do something that's going to make you happy. Do something that's going to be worthwhile for you at the end. Don't do stuff that you just, okay, I'm good at it. I guess I'll do it. No. If anything, do what makes your heart happy. And it's more of a challenge for you because at the end of the day, when you do something that's more challenging for you and you see yourself accomplishing these goals little by little along the way, doesn't that make you much happier? Doesn't that make you much prouder of yourself? I like to think so. And that's how it was for me at such a young age in high school. So I completely quit tennis. I went full force into softball. And even with going full force into softball, I still wasn't the fucking best softball athlete I I could have been, you know? And, And that's because I practiced hard. I got hit so many times in the fucking face with the ball. I got so many bruises. I couldn't slide for the life of me to the base. Like, you know, I just wasn't that good no matter how hard I tried but I still stuck it out I still went to practice every day I still showed up to the games even if they were just putting me on the bench and not playing me one fucking inning of the game I was still there because I love the sport and because I told myself one day they'll play you one day you'll get there and so it came my junior year I made the varsity team But even with making the varsity team, I hardly ever fucking played. I maybe played one inning and that was that. Like, it, I never played. <clears throat> Sorry, but I was, I was still a good sport about it. You know, I didn't sit there and cry. I sat there in the dugout and I sang the chants. I cheered for every single girl that went up to bat. I cheered every time that we got a good player, we made an out. You know, I was I was a good sport. I was a good sport about it the whole way out. But at the same time, I was itching to play. Like like I, you know, I may not be the best athlete, but I've got something. I've got something there. Like let me let me show it to you. Let me prove it to you. And so it got to a point in my junior year where I was, you know, I was at practice one day and practice ended and and I pulled the coaches aside and I said, listen, you know, um, what if you put me back in JV? Like, if you put me back in JV, will you play me more? 
And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Like, if, if you want to go back to JV, we'll play you a lot more. And I was like, okay, um, here's my varsity jersey. I will gladly trade it in for a JV jersey if that means that I'll be playing more. And so it was a matter of putting my pride aside of wanting to wear the varsity jersey, putting my pride aside 100% so that I can go and practice more and and even these games that I was playing that was practice for me that's practice to get to varsity for to be able to to have my coaches say crystal you're in because we know you got it so that was practice for me and it was just a matter of putting my pride aside turning in that jersey that I so badly wanted and and it was a gold jersey too the varsity our colors were black and gold so it was a matter of turning in that gold jersey and getting the black one just so that I could practice more to be able to prove myself when the time comes that I was ready to go back on varsity. Um, my senior year, uh, I was back on varsity, and while I didn't play every single inning or every single game, I played more, um, and I was okay with that. And at this point, I wasn't going to go back to JV. I was, I was okay with where I was because at least I was playing, and I wasn't just sat on the bench every single fucking game without playing a single inning. I was okay with, I was playing more. I was happy with that. Um, so, you know, we, we had some pretty incredible players on our team, uh, specifically our pitcher, her name was Sam. Uh, she was a hell of a player, hell of a ball player, great arm. She was someone that I was for sure that she was going to get a full ride to college because of her ability to play softball so well. I was for sure of it. Um, but even with her being so good, uh, if you guys know who this person is, if you're from the Valley or if she's listening to this girl, I'm not trying to put you down in any way, but you were a brat. All right, flat out, you were a brat. <clears throat> and I'm sure I'm not the only one who fucking saw it. Um, she was a damn good player, but she was a brat. Um, you know, if they sat her out once to switch her out to let her arm rest, I mean, they're not fucking pulling you out because you're bad, bro. They're pulling you out because they want your arm to rest. She would throw a fucking tantrum. If she, uh, you know, threw a pitch and that person hit a home run, tantrum. If someone hit the ball directly fucking to her and she missed it, tantrum. Like tantrum after fucking tantrum. And it showed, but they kept putting her in because she was such a good player. And I'm over here on the bench fucking thinking like, not once have I done that to you guys. And when I say you guys, I'm talking about my coaches. Not once have I fucking done that to you guys. I don't act like that. Like I show you respect. I show this sport respect. I show my other athletes respect. And you rather win, you're, you're more concerned about winning than, you know, letting, so because was, it wasn't just me on the bench, it was other girls too, than letting us play a little. It's fucking high school. It's high school, you know, and, and, and that hurt me. And again, I never complained about it, but it's what I saw and it's what I was thinking at the time. And I, I vividly remember one game, you know, my dad and my sister were at every single softball game. My mom didn't make it to every single one, but my dad and my sister were at every single softball game. And my dad, bless his heart, man, I fucking love my dad. I, I could have sucked so bad during the game. I struck out every fucking time I went up to bat. I missed a ball. I didn't throw it right. You know, I, did, I just did bad. The minute I came out of the dugout, he was the first person waiting for me with open arms to give me a hug and to say, hey, these are some of the things we need to practice on, but good fucking game. Good game. We're going to get them next time. You're going to get them next time. Like we just, we just got to practice. We got to practice and you'll get there. Not, hey, you sucked. Like I, I'm telling you, you had to do this or I'm telling you, you should have practiced harder. Never. Not once. Not once. Always with open arms. Always saying, we're going to get them next time. You just got to work a little harder. And even if I sucked, he was like, hey, you know, even in the play that I, I could have sucked really badly, he always found something good to tell me from the play. Like, yes, this happened. But what about this? Like, that was really good. Like, he always made me see a different side of something that I would have never seen in, in what just happened to me. 
Um, so I love my dad for that. And, and you can see how that has has moved me and impacted me into the person that I am today and why I see things the way that I do and why I always tend to see the positive in a negative situation because that was instilled in me at such a young age. I never had someone constantly pushing negativity on me. I always had someone telling me, you will do better next time, just practice harder and you will do it. So, and, and it wasn't babying either. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like next time, next time, let's go get some ice cream. It was like, no, listen, you do need to put in the work. You do need to work harder, but because you work harder and because you practice more, you will see a better outcome, you know? And so it, it was like that with my dad and me, and I love my dad for that. Um, so I had a, a head coach and we had an assistant coach, just like I'm sure everybody else does, but, uh, I don't remember our head coach's name, but I vividly remember our assistant coach, and it was Papa Bear. Um, if you're from Egg Couch Elsa, he may still be around, but it's Mr. Peacock. And Papa Bear is someone that I will never forget because, you know, even though he was assistant coach, he never had very much say so in um, who was chosen to play or what plays we were going to do. It was always my head coach. Um, my Papa Bear never had much say so in it and I remember you know just sitting on the bench after a game that we we actually went to we went to like a championships or something like we had done good and we were off to play against a really good team a well-known team to where this pitcher fucking struck out every single batter that came her way we had to travel up north for that and you know, here I was thinking, I am a senior in high school. This is one of the last softball games that I will ever play because it was the championships game. And, they, you know, they have to play me at least once. They, they've got to, you know, they, they got to be, they got to have some sort of something in their heart to, to let me play. And I didn't. I didn't play one inning. I wasn't led up to bat not once. And we lost. We lost because that pitcher was fucking good. She was, damn, she was good. And she had an arm on her. Um, and we lost. And it was also, was it prom night? No. Th there was something else going on that, you know, a lot of girls didn't show up because something else was going on. It wasn't prom, but it was something uh, somewhere along that line. But I still showed up. I still got on that bus that morning. And I still went to that game. I gave up whatever it was that was going on that these other girls saw more important and I got on that bus, I put my uniform on, I put my cleats on and I got on that bus and I still wasn't played. And you know, I still sat there, I still sang the chants, I still cheered on my girls and at the end of the game, you know, everybody was packing up, everybody was leaving, my dad didn't go to that game because it was pretty far. <laughs> Uh, my dad didn't go to that game, so I just kind of sat behind in the dugout for a bit, just kind of thinking, you know, that was my last softball game. I'm never going to play high school softball again, and I wasn't even let on the field once. Um, so I was pretty bummed, and I was sitting there. And Papa Bear comes and sit, sits next to me and he's like, I want you to know that I tried my damn hardest to get him to change his mind and let you play at least once. To put you in for at least one inning. He's like, but he wouldn't budge. He wouldn't budge. He's like, I'm going to be honest with you. We came into this game knowing that we weren't going we weren't gonna to win. And he still couldn't change his mind. He couldn't budget to let you, to let you play. And I was like, you know what? It, it's okay. <clears throat> you know, it is what it is. Um, it's done. It's over with. Oh, well. And that's how Papa Bear was with me throughout, you know, my entire softball. Uh, not career. I was going to say career. Definitely not a career. Uh, throughout my whole softball experience in high school. Uh, he was always very motivating for me and like he, you know, if, if it was a game that I didn't play, you know, I'd be in the dugout and he looked over, he would look over at me and just be like, you know, he didn't have to say anything. I could see it in his eyes that he was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and he would always 
be there on me every single practice because he wanted the head coach to be able to see something in me and make me, you know, a, a priority in, in the list that he would create every day before the game. And so he worked with me at practice and he was always hard on me at practice, but he was hard on me for a reason because he wanted to see me be a better player. He wanted to see me on the field so that I could prove myself to this other man who just couldn't fucking get it in his head. Um, but he played a big role in my life too. So we're going to make a switch from that now. Um, that, that just goes to show... Uh, in my eyes, the importance of sports specifically for me and how it grounded me, how it humbled me because something that I love so much and yet I wasn't very good at, I still continue to push and to make it work so that I could be better. Um, it taught me a lot, softball taught me a lot in my life. Uh, I hold a lot of valuable lessons from that sport that I carry on to this day. So we're going to move on for softball. We're going to go into college now. Um, I started off at UTPA, which is a college out of Edinburgh, Texas, which is in the Valley. So I started in the Valley. I started as a pre-med student because I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be able to help people. That was my main goal in life was to help people in some way, shape or form. And to me, the best way to help people was to become a doctor. So I went in as a pre-med student. Um, that dream was squashed real quick when I realized that my math skills were not up to par. Um, I took remedial math three times my freshman year before I ever fucking graduated to the next math class. And um, it sucked. And I quickly had to make a decision for myself as to what was next. You know, and, and to tell you the truth, I wasn't willing. That was something that even though I wanted it, my heart wasn't completely there. And because my heart wasn't completely there, I wasn't willing to put in the extra effort and work to study that much harder to get good at math. I was like, no. Like, you know, because I'm, I'm not even fully 100% into it. It was just that in my mind, the best way to help people was to be a doctor. That was what was in my mind. Um, but that didn't hold any truth for me. So I quickly had to make a decision and I went to speech therapy next. And so I made the switch in uh, my major. I started doing classes to, to do speech therapy. And, and while I was doing those classes, it was the same thing. Like this, this isn't it for me. I'm not happy with this. Um, so then I had to quickly make a change again and it was it was frustrating because I didn't want to be that kid in college that was constantly changing their fucking degree. But at the same time, it makes sense. It's understandable because you're still learning, you know, even though you're considered an adult at this time, you're still learning. You're still trying to figure out what you want to do in life. You know, that takes time. You know, fortunately for some people, they know right away what they want to do in life. But for most of us, it takes time to figure out who we are still as individuals and what we want to be. And that's what was happening for me throughout, you know, these first few years of college. Two of my best friends, Janet and Clarissa, were attending UTSA, which is the University of Texas at San Antonio. And San Antonio was four hours north of where I lived, which was the Rio Grande Valley. And, um, you know, it, my friend Clarissa, Janet was a business major. Clarissa was a communication major. And she was, you know, I asked her because I didn't know. I knew what the business major entailed for Janet, but I didn't fully understand what this communication major entailed and what opportunities it could bring to you if you pursued it. So I got to talking to Clarissa and I was like, you know, can you explain to me a little bit more of, of, of what this is or, or what kind of jobs you can do? And the more she got into talking about it with me, the more I was like, yes, like that, that is interesting to me. That intrigues me. I can see myself doing that. I can see myself there. And, you know, she told me, you know, UTSA is one of the best places that you can come and get your bachelor's in communication. You know, the programs that they offer, the classes and everything. It's just really well known for communication. And so I made the leap 
my junior year of college, I applied, I got in and I moved, you know, I, at the time I was already on my own. I had moved out of my parents' house. I was living in an apartment with my good friend, Tommy. And he was also at the time in a transition to move or to transfer to Texas State. And so I was kind of left on the verge too. You know, he told me I'm going to Texas State, like you're on your own. And so that gave me more of an urge to say, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna go too. Um, and even though I was independent at the time, living on my own, I still had my mom there. My mom was taking me to lunch every day. My mom was helping me out wherever she could. And I wanted more independence. I wanted to feel that independence. I wanted to be prideful of having my, my own full independence. So I took the leap, I moved to San Antonio, and I pursued my bachelor's degree in communications. And it's one of the best decisions I could have made for myself ever. Um, to be four hours away from your family and be able to, to fend for yourself, fully fend for yourself with no one around you because I had no family in San Antonio. It was me and it was two of my best friends, Janet and Clarissa. You know, I had to get a job and, uh, you know, work full time and go to college. And that was rough for me. You know, it was really rough for me. And, and learning those transitions and having these bigger bills to pay now, uh, it was hard but it taught me a lot it taught me a lot about managing my money about spending my time wisely you know at that time we were very much into partying we were very much into living our lives up and, and, and living it in college in san antonio and um it, it was hard to to balance all of that but i made it happen because this degree <clears throat> this communication degree really intrigued me and i and i loved what i could see for myself in that degree so I ended up graduating in 2012 with my bachelor's degree in communication and I am extremely proud of that but I will say that it is sitting in a closet doing absolutely fucking nothing but who uses their degrees these days no one right you get it for a fancy piece of paper you spend a shit ton of money and that's that um everybody wants experience these days uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm still extremely proud of it. I'm, I'm proud of the groups that I was able to be a part of. I learned a lot in, in the classes that I was able to take as electives and it really taught me about what really intrigued me and, and what moved me as a person. Specifically, I had to take a lot of speech classes for this communication major and I hated talking in front of people. Like I got fucking anxiety attacks knowing that I had to take, I wasn't even enrolled in the speech class yet. And I was already having panic attacks, just knowing that I had to enroll in these classes and talk in front of a class of people. Oh God, it, it scared the shit out of me. I hated, hated public speaking. Um, but I had to, if I wanted to graduate with my bachelor's degree in communication, I had to take these classes. And it wasn't just one fucking speech class. It was like three or four that you had to go through. And I sucked in my first, uh, my first two speech classes, I sucked. You know, I was on the verge of failing because I mean, I had, I had good content. I had good write-ups of this speech, but yet it wasn't fucking coming out of my mouth and I was stuttering and I was stumbling and it got me bad grades. I mean, I had great fucking content. I had a good speech. I just couldn't say it. Um, and it wasn't until I made this switch for myself. Uh, I was very overweight in college. Um, I didn't eat right. I didn't exercise. Uh, I was very overweight. I was over 200 pounds. And I made this switch for myself when I, I couldn't even tell you. I was on Facebook one day and I came across uh, this promotional video for a Tough Mudder run. And this was back in uh, 2011. It was, it was probably October or November 2011. And I came across this promotional video and it struck something inside me. I mean, not only were the visuals cool and the music was fucking badass, but I saw these people running 11 to 12 miles with so many obstacles in between these 11 to 12 miles, obstacles that included emerging yourself in ice and water and going over walls and being electrocuted like I was like what the fuck like these people are insane but the faces and the pride in the eye and their eyes that they had when they crossed that finish line I was like I want that 
I, I want what I see in their eyes right now. I want that. And you know, you know, I, at the same time, I'm wanting this so badly, but I'm thinking you can't even run for two fucking minutes straight. How do you ever expect to get through that? And it, it made a switch. I texted my good friend, Tony, back in the valley, who was very much into to exercising. And I said, hey, would you do this with me? And he's like, absolutely. Let's sign up. Let's train. Let's do this. And so I did. I, I mean, it's not cheap to, to enter those fucking races. So I you know, had to work my ass off at work to get some extra money to pay the 80 to 100 bucks it cost to, to even register for these things. And once I was registered, I was registered. There was no turning back. I'm not the type of person that's going to fucking sign up for something and not do it. And I made the switch. I started buying uh, frozen chicken breasts in a bag because it was cheaper than buying fresh chicken breast. I bought that. I, bro I bought frozen uh, broccoli and vegetables like that. And that's what I started eating. And, and then I, I, I made the switch completely. It's not like little by little I started doing it. No, I completely made the fucking switch because I was like, it's go time. This Tough Mudder is in January. It was like October, November. I was like, you got to fucking step it up if you want that pride from that accomplishment. And so I did. I completely cut out everything. I cut out the pizza. I cut out the hot pockets, the ramen noodles, the things that I was living off of. I completely cut it out. I switched to chicken. I switched to broccoli. Uh, and I did it. I lost a good 20 to 30 pounds before that race even came along. And I'll tell you what, it took a lot to get through that first race. Um, it was very hard for me. It proved to me that it was I wasn't as in shape as I thought I was. But I was proud of the journey to get there um, because I would step out of the apartment and I was like, OK, you're going to set your timer for five minutes and you need to at least be able to run for five minutes straight. And that's what I did. Little by little by little, I started building up my endurance. I would get my workouts off Pinterest like they were just little circuits of like 20 squats, 30 this, 40 that. And that's what I would do. I would go on Pinterest to look for workouts and then I would go outside and I would run for as long as I could without stopping to build up my endurance. And within those three, four months that I had to train, I fucking did it. I showed up to that Tough Mudder with my good friend, Tony. We had our matching fucking shirts and everything. It was cold as shit that morning, but I did it. And I had never felt more proud of myself than I did that day. It was so incredibly inspiring for me. It was so incredibly motivating for me that it pushed me to keep going. I was like, all right, you know, it was pretty rough to get through this one. We're going to sign up for another one and we're going to do better. And I did. I ended up completing four to five Tough Mudders within 2012. And on top of those four to five Tough Mudders, I ended up completing about three to four Spartan races as well. Now, I'm telling you that when I fucking set my mind to something, I am going to get it done no matter what it takes. That's just who I am. That's just how I was raised. That's just how impactful these people and things that happen along the way have left me. And I did. And, and I was so incredibly proud of myself. I'm still proud of myself to this day for those accomplishments because nothing beats the feeling of crossing that finish line after going through complete fucking hell. It was the best, some of the most amazing memories to this day in my life. Um, so that was that part of my life. The next challenge and next impactful part of my life would have to be Rackspace. Rackspace uh, was one of the number one companies in San Antonio at the time. They were an IT based company, internet hosting company. And uh, the, I was a nanny at the time for a family of five and the, the husband, father of the family just so happened to be the president of this company. And that is how I started learning about it. That is how I started hearing about it. And um, it intrigued me. And I started looking it up and I found that, you know, there was articles saying it is harder to get a position at Rackspace than it is to get accepted into Harvard. And just like that, snap of a finger, challenge accepted. So 
Even though I had the president of the fucking company at the at my fingertips, I took advantage of that. Like, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I, I didn't take advantage of that whatsoever. You know, I went up to Lou and Laura and I said, I found a position at Rackspace. It is an entry position. I'm going to apply for it. And I'm just letting you know now, because if I get the position, that would mean that, you know, I can no longer work for you guys. And they were all for it. I had already been with them for two to three years. They were actually, they're a part of my family to this day. They're still a part of my family. They mean a lot to me. And um, they were all for it. And, and Lou even told me himself, he's like, you know, even if I'm the president of the fucking company, like I can't do anything for you. You have to do this yourself. You have to prove to these people of the team that you're gonna be working on, you have to prove yourself to them and I can't do anything for you in that aspect of it. And I was like, good, because I don't want you to do anything for me. And so I applied for the position and I researched my ass off into this company i stayed up so late every night because i got home late as it was i got home like at nine or ten at night from from working for this family uh, because i had to bathe the kids put them to bed and everything so i got home late and i would get home i would get on my laptop and i would research the shit out of this company what do you stand for what are your values what are you looking for in an employee what do you guys even fucking do what does internet hosting mean like i emerged myself into every article into every youtube video that i can find in this company or on this company and i did it i got a phone interview uh the phone interview wasn't very hard it was just them getting to know you and stuff i landed an in-person interview and you know, I, I even played, I, oh man, I wish I could remember the name of the song, but it's a song where like Kanye and all these guys are on there and it's like one of the most fucking motivational songs ever. God, I wish I knew the name of it. But I blasted that song in my truck and I drove to Rackspace. I drove with all my papers. I had printed everything out. I had everything in front of me so that I could read it over one more time before I went into this interview. And I walked into that building and I realized that I was up against six other people. There were six other people there competing against me for this one position. Not two positions, three positions, no, one fucking position for six people that were there, seven, including me. And I, I was intimidated. I was intimidated because I didn't have money to buy nice clothes. I put together what I could to, to wear something nice to this interview. And you know, some of these girls were there were so, fucking super fancy outfits. There was guys there like in the full get up suit. And I was like, man, you know, because you know, a lot of it is that it, it's how you come off as soon as someone sees you, how you dress, unfortunately. Um, so I was pretty intimidated, but at the same time, I was like, you know your shit, you studied your ass off, you've got this, like just, just be confident in yourself. And so they took us all to individual rooms. Each, each one of us was in an individual room. And how the interview worked is that there was about four to five different groups of people that would come in and out to ask us questions. It was rough. It was fucking scary. It was scary as shit. It's a tiny little, it's like an interrogation room with a whiteboard and a little table and chairs and you don't know what the fuck is going on. They would come in out of nowhere, sit down and start throwing out these questions at you. And some of them were very technical because this is a technical company and they want to make sure you know your shit because you're coming into work for them. And I did know my shit. I did. And so I utilized everything in this fucking room that I could. I, you know, they asked me like, what is the cloud? And because a lot of what they do is on the cloud, you know, these days you put everything in the fucking cloud. So they're like, what is the cloud? And I was like, would you mind if I use the whiteboard to like draw it out for you and show you? And they're like, go ahead. And so I did. I drew out this pyramid that I specifically remember seeing in a video. And it stuck with me because that is what helped me memorize what the cloud was and it helped me understand it. So I drew that for them because that's what I knew. That's how I remembered it. And the very, so that was one that I remember the most. The last one that I remember 
it, she ended up being my manager when I got hired, but um, it was just her. It might have been her and one other person, but I only remember her from my memories. And she was the last person in the interview. And it was, you know, that final question, why should we hire you? And I got teary eyed. I wasn't like full on tears crying, but I got very teary eyed. And I was like, I want this. I want this more than any other person that you've been talking to today. I have worked extremely hard for this. I am a hard worker with practice and patience. I can get where you need me to be, to be successful. You need me and I want this. And that was that. I, I left that day not really sure what was going to happen because who knows what the fuck these other people had to offer that I was up against. And I got the call a few days later and they're like, they love you. You made a big impact on them and you got the job. And do you know how fucking proud of myself I was to be able to tell myself that where I read that it was harder to get into Harvard than it was this com I mean, it was harder to get into this company than it was Harvard. I just got in. I just fucking got a job there. That made me so fucking proud because when I see a challenge and it hits me personally, I'm going to take that challenge and I'm going to get it no matter what it takes. Had I not gotten the job that first time around, I guarantee you I would have tried again and again and again until I got that job. So that, that one piece right there sticks with me for a long time and I'm still proud of that moment in my life where I'm able to say that I even got a job at Rackspace. Um, I ended up leaving Rackspace when Daniel and I moved to Florida and I miss it very much, but my time there was, was very meaningful. I made some lifelong friendships there. And along with that, this is where I got introduced into CrossFit. Um, I wasn't doing CrossFit at the time. My training for Tough Mudders and Spartans came up for my own. You know, I, I did running in the trails. I did a lot of that because that's a lot of what these Spartan and Tough Mudders entail. It's, it's running uh, these tough courses um, that's not track or anything like that. It's out in the woods. And so I did a lot of trail running. I, I enrolled myself into a Gold's Gym. And I kind you know, I couldn't afford a personal trainer. So I kind of always looked upon people who were having these personal trainings done. And, you know, I would mimic what they were doing because I couldn't afford it. And I didn't really know what the fuck I was doing either. I found myself being very repetitive in everything that I did at Gold's Gym. And it was kind of getting me nowhere because I was doing the same shit every single day. And I wasn't really seeing much results out of that other than me losing weight. Um... So I kind of took it upon myself to reach out to my friend Tony again and for him to give me advice as to what I should be doing. So I started incorporating uh, box jumps, stuff like that. Um, so I was a little familiarized when I came into CrossFit, but CrossFit, um, I was that person who vividly, I vividly remember saying CrossFit is stupid. These people are fucking stupid. Like they're going to get hurt. I had never tried it. I had never walked into a fucking CrossFit box, but I was the first person talking shit about it. Um, and it, you know, it, it happens a lot and it, it's going to keep happening until you're willing to put your pride aside and actually get your ass inside the CrossFit box and try it out. And it'll shut you up like this guaranteed. It'll shut you the fuck up. So you know, I was I had a coworker, Lacey, and I was very much encouraging her to come with me to Gold so that I could start helping her get into exercise. And Gold's was pretty far from rack space, at least the one that I knew and the one I went to, and the one that I wanted to take her to. And rack space actually offered CrossFit for free. If you were an employee of CrossFit, they had a CrossFit box right outside that they called the yard. Um, because it looked like a, a scene out of, out of a jail. Uh, it, it looked like that type of setup. And they offered free CrossFit classes there. It was free for you if you were an employee of Rackspace. They had all the equipment set up. They had all the right coaches. And she's like, why don't we just go to CrossFit? Like, it's literally two fucking feet outside. Like, let's go. And I was like, all right, fine, fine. So I gave in. I walked in and... I never went to Gold's after that day. It shut me up so hard. 
I was greeted by Dan, who was the head coach. He's still the head coach, I think. And I never had someone at Gold come up to me and call me an athlete right away. Like, hey, athlete. Me? I'm an athlete? Like, that made me feel good for someone to call me an athlete. I was like, bro, do I fucking look like one? That's badass. Like, but that's just how he referred to everybody there. All of y'all are athletes. Every single one of you are an athlete for stepping in here today. That's pretty fucking cool. That's motivation in itself. And on top of that, he asked me, you know, are there any injuries I should know about? You know, how well do you know exercise what are you doing now what are you familiar with like he was very intrigued by me and i'm sure with everybody else that first walked into his gym he wanted to know who you were what your goals were and if there was anything that he should watch out for before he coaches you i didn't fucking have that at golds i had fucking people giving me stink eye at golds like that's just not what you get at a gold type of environment and I had that the first day that I walked into CrossFit. Luckily, the workout was it was something that I was, there was no barbells involved. Thank fucking God, because that intimidated the shit out of me. Um, it was like jump rope, box jumps, stuff that I had already been doing. So I felt pretty confident about that. But it was in the reps that they did and the amount of um, rounds that they did that wore me the fuck out. I had never done, you know, those repetitions of box jumps and jump ropes and all this other shit for that amount of time and that amount of rounds and it got me good. And I was like, I thought I was in shape. I thought I was very much in shape. I was wrong. It proved me wrong. And I took that as my next challenge because I saw these other girls there lifting these crazy weights and doing these fucking monkey like shit on the fucking rig and I was like that's badass I want to do that and so I made a commitment to myself that day that I was going to get to where I saw those girls I was going to be able to lift the weight over my head I was going to be able to do pull-ups I was going to be able to do all this other stuff that these girls were doing that I was not able to do I took that as my next challenge and I did and for the next few months I emerged myself in the sport of CrossFit. I went, I bought the shoes, I bought the lifting shoes, the knee pads, you know, the Reebok stuff. Like I went full on CrossFit freak. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I loved the people, I loved the community, I loved the vibe, I loved the energy. To this day, it's why I've stuck to CrossFit. I've been doing CrossFit for nearly six years now. I will not go to another fucking sport because I love what CrossFit brings, what it brings to the table that other sports will not bring. And, and I worked very, very hard day in and day out. I even signed up for my first CrossFit competition. It was going to be with all the girls in the box. It was an all girls competition and we were so fucking pumped. And we were working on double unders um, because we knew one of the workouts was going to call for a lot of double unders. And uh, we worked our asses off and we were so pumped for this competition that was coming up. And so during that time is when I also met Daniel. Uh, Daniel will always be an important part of my life. He will always be one of the most impactful people in my life. Daniel is very opposite from me um, in a good way. Daniel cannot, not that he cannot, but he will never let anyone bring his mood down or he will never let anyone affect him. I'm pretty opposite in that way. Like I can read one fucking comment on Instagram and instantly be pissed or instantly have my mood change. Like, and with him, he's like, but it's fucking internet. It's stupid ass people. Who cares? Like, and that's what I love about him. A lot of the things that he is are things that I aspire to be. I want to be the person that doesn't let shit like that, mediocre shit like that, or meaningless shit like that get to me. I want to get to that level that he's at. Daniel was always up for a good time. I'm very much introverted. Like I rather fucking party at the house, just me and him. And he rather go be with a big group of people. Um, he's just a social butterfly. And I wish I was a social butterfly because I come off as a complete bitch sometimes to complete strangers because I'm not that social butterfly. 
And I wish I was. And it's something that I work on because I see him be like that every single day. And I always hope to be more like him and the more I learn from him. So he's always been a big part of my life. And this at this point, when I just started CrossFit is also when I started dating Daniel and realizing the person that he was and realizing that this is the person I want. I want this person in my life because I know how beneficial they're going to be for me. And I love this person. I loved him right off the bat. I just never wanted to admit it. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to hold the feelings in because that's the type of person that I am. Um, so we started dating and, um, this is where the next very pivotal moment in my life comes up. And with that, you guys will have to tune into episode two, where I will be bringing on Daniel and we will be talking about the car accident and we will be hearing it from his point of view because nobody has ever heard it from Daniel's point of view, not because they don't want to, but because no one has ever asked him. Uh, this is going to be a complete surprise to him. He has no idea what I'm going to be asking of him for this episode. So I hope you guys tune in for episode two. I don't know how this is going to play out. You know, he he's not one to fully show his emotions. But, you know, this is something where I really wanted to see if I can get him to go back to that day and really emerge himself into those memories and see what we can bring out of him along with me helping him along the way um, to give my input on that day as well. So I hope you guys tune in. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you guys have a great day.